Hello, my name is Ian Hawkins. I'm the editor of PEX Network, and welcome to our webinar, Explainable AI, Making Sense of the Machine for Trust and Transparency. Before we get going, a reminder that we'll be taking audience questions at the end of the presentation, so if you would like to interact, tap your question into the Q&A box on your screen. This is also the place to let us know of any technical issues you're experiencing, and one of my colleagues will try and put things right as quickly as possible if you let us know you're having problems. So in today's webinar, we're looking at the reasons limiting enterprise adoption of AI. This is a major issue because in the highly regulated industries such as financial services and insurance, regulators are increasingly requiring full explainability and auditability into the actions of AI-based processes. So by the end of this session, we should have learned how to solve the challenges of explainable AI, how to automate processes to become more transparent, and how to deploy AI solutions with more trust and transparency. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Slater Viktorov, who's been building AI, machine learning, and deep learning solutions for the enterprise for the best part of the last decade. Slater's worked with everyone from the federal government to two-person startups, all the way up to the Fortune 100, and today he is CTO at Indico Data. Slater, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you everyone for making the time today to come hear about explainability in AI. This is a topic that I personally and Indico as an organization care very, very deeply about. Obviously one that's getting a lot of press in recent years and, and would really love to talk through how we think about this problem and, and how we really address this in the enterprise. Uh, first, just a quick note on Indico. We're a Boston-based enterprise AI solution that was founded in 2013. Uh, we use deep learning-based technology to help enterprises adopt AI in a much more seamless way than they would be able to otherwise, with a deep emphasis on text, image, and document-based information. Uh, in 2018, we were named a Gartner, Gartner Cool Vendor, very specifically for our work on explainability in the machine learning and AI space. So, um, you know, personally, I'm the founder and CTO here, but really what you're here to hear about is explainability. Now, what we want to walk you through, uh, the first couple of points here will maybe be a little slow for some of you, but we'll get into the meat of this relatively quickly. What is AI? You know, there are easily 100 different, different definitions out there on the web, so want to put a line in the sand as to how we'll be using the term throughout this presentation. Talk very specifically about the, the black box problem, how it's perceived, and the reality of it. Talk through something that we like to call the paradox of explainability. Uh, move towards, rather than a classical notion or sort of a very uh, formal notion of explainability, a more modern framework for thinking about it. And that's going to make a lot more sense in the context of the paradox of explainability. Talk on accuracy for a note because it's one of the most important notes here. And then we're going to go through a practical demonstration, how you actually understand uh, machine learning models in practice, walk through our tool a little bit to give you a really deep sense of how you should be looking at these, the kind of explainability you should be looking for for a modern machine learning system. So first, what is AI? How exactly do we classify it? Um, and what really do we mean by modern AI? Is it different than what we were developing in the 50s or not? Um, the way that we're going to be talking about this is rather than traditional algorithms in, in the AI world, you're not going from an initial state forward with no steps. Uh, the idea is you are instead starting from the goal, the thing that you want to achieve and working backwards from that. Um, so to say this another way, uh, if I were to make a sentiment analysis engine, right, and I wanted to read Twitter and determine whether the mentions of my company were positive or negative in a traditional algorithmic sense, I would define ahead of time exactly what I meant by positive or negative. I might put a lexicon together. I might say, uh, yes, if they say good, increment us slightly in the direction of positive, right? If they say bad, that'll increment us slightly in the direction of negative. And in that way, we'll slowly trudge towards our goal state of knowing the, the positive or negative. In the AI context, you flip this problem on the head. Rather than defining exactly what you mean by good and bad in terms of the, the literal words, you instead say, I read this tweet and I know it is positive. I might not be able to say, oh, it's because you know good should be weighted at 0.7 and bad should be weighted at 0.4, but I know it's positive and I wanna work backwards from there and really rely heavily on the computer to determine what it should be paying attention to, how it should be combining these features, um, such that we can get to an appropriate goal state. Now, specifically, deep learning has arisen in the last uh, really five, six years. It's become very, very popular. 
And as opposed to older machine learning and AI techniques that would only work in that kind of backward solving uh, modality for simpler problems, the extent of problems that we can tackle with deep learning has expanded really broadly uh, and very specifically around very complex problems. Um, these are typically problems of text and image, places where you've got a lot of fuzziness or the ability to hard code a set of rules to perform this task might be very, very difficult or potentially even impossible. And that fundamentally means that these problems have a, a vast scale. They're significantly more complex than you will deal with in a traditional algorithmic setting. Um, but deep learning really uh, is very effective at solving those problems and can actually find solutions working backwards uh, through a really massive series of, of sort of trials and errors, right? Uh, if we were to do the same thing, we might, you know, tweak the individual weights on words a hundred different times before we found what the right value was. And we can use machines and deep learning in particular to automate a lot of that process for us and really help us get the best possible model as quickly as possible. However, that really introduces this, this issue of the black box, right? These are very, very complex decisions. Uh, and the question of exactly how they operate, how exactly do those values get set, jumps immediately to the assertion that these deep learning models are unexplainable black boxes. Uh, and we'll dig into a little bit what, what exactly people mean when they say black boxes. But this is a very, very prevalent uh, point of view. So we've got just a series of quotes here by various people, both within the machine learning and deep learning community, from government research labs, from media publishers. But the assertion that any and all deep learning techniques are inherently uh, black boxes and impossible to introspect is an extremely prevalent one. Uh, these are all from the last two years. So these aren't, aren't kind of old takes on this. Um, you even see things, uh, you know, very, very extreme. If I were to call your attention to the quote in the upper right-hand corner quickly, um, asserting that the journey from input to output is next to impossible for even their developers to comprehend, right? What they're saying there is that these systems are so complex, the decisions that they have to make so complicated that even for the person creating this algorithm, right, creating this machine learning model, it's impossible to know what's happening. It's a very, very bold assertion, and one, again, that's very, very prevalent. There's only one problem with it. Um, they're not black boxes. Um, and, you know, if you don't understand what's on the right, that's, that's totally fine. These are two very popular uh, machine learning models uh, created in the last couple of years, VGGNet and the exception net. And what you'll see here is literally a layout of every single neuron within these neural networks, right? This is as detailed as you possibly get given just this picture. Any machine learning researcher can recreate any of these papers from scratch, right? So that sure doesn't feel like a black box. But at the same time, this isn't what we really categorize as a useful explanation. You know, I can stare at this all day. It still doesn't help me understand exactly how uh, machine vision works. But we have tools for that too. Um, here, and I'll talk through this relatively quickly, but this is a paper from 2014 that did a significant survey of the different ways we have of examining the output and internal neural networks. And you can see that we've got quite a lot of tools at our disposal. Uh, what we see here over on the left, uh, this is we're going through every individual layer of the neural net and showing not only what is it picking up on, each one of these little squares show you, you know, what is this specific neuron responsible for, right? But also where they appear in the data, right? Here's an example of an image that shows this with a really high degree of fidelity. Um, what you see over here on the right, another way of slicing and dicing it, right? So given a picture of a, sort of a dog, right? Which portions of this image are we paying attention to when we make the decision about whether or not this is a dog? Right, um, and you see here again, here are exactly the features that we're picking up on. Here's all of the information we're using to make this decision. But you kind of end up in the same spot. You know, I, I don't think that in the traditional sense of a black box, you can look at this information and say there's no way of introspecting deep learning models, right? It's, it's simply not true. But at the same time, anyone that looks at this would hesitate to call this an explanation. Um, and this leads us really quickly to what we do call this, this paradox of explainability. The trouble is that the literal 
definition of what's happening within a neural network may be an explanation, but it's not particularly intuitive. It's not particularly useful. Even though it literally may be an explanation, it's not really what anyone means when they say an explanation. Um, so we want to dig into that a little bit. Um, because the other thing is that it's not that people are inherently uncomfortable working with systems whose decision-making processes aren't well understood, right? What, what we say is that every company deals with black boxes and it's, it's not inherently a negative thing. We, in, in fact, very intentionally sort of black box people, right? We don't ever ask a person, hey, we want to, you know, open up your skull, look at all your neurons, figure out how you decided that this check was okay for approval, right? That's, again, not what we mean when we say we want you to explain what you did. What we're looking for is something much higher level. Um, this is a, a quote from the chief decision intelligence officer at Google. Um, and she's taken a very, very particular view of what exactly we do mean when we say explainability, right? And, and this kind of a counter assertion that you can't refuse to trust anything whose you know, very literal decision making process you don't understand, right? If that's your point of view, if that's your assertion that you want to see every individual neuron in the neural network, you got to fire all of your human workers, right? Uh, because no one knows how those decisions are actually made. And, and what we've seen is that kind of no matter how much detail you go into on the literals of the deep learning network, right, it, it does not scratch that itch that as close to an explanation as we might think that is, that's clearly not scratching our itch. Um, because again, it's very important to, to have this explanation, right? Because we can't, it's not that there's one extreme where we're looking at every neuron and one extreme where we have no idea what's happening and there's nothing in between. There is still a really profound need for explainability. We just really need to understand what we mean when we say explainability. And for the vast majority of business users, evaluating the algorithm is not what we mean. Right? It's not particularly useful. It's very clearly not the right level of granularity to be having this discussion on. Um, and, and this is really what we mean when we say the paradox of explainability. Right? We don't know exactly where we want to focus when it comes to explainability. So what we want to take you through in the rest of this is, is a little bit of a history. What is a black box? Why are black boxes used in engineering? What's sort of the origin of the term? And actually use some historical corollaries for, for how we can tackle this problem for AI. Uh, so, you know, keep calm. We're going to go through some real world examples. This is a very resolvable problem, um, even, even if it's a little unsettling at first. So, uh, the first question, what is a black box? Uh, some of you might might realize this, but the original term black box comes from the very literal black boxes used in circuit design. If you open up any piece of hardware, you'll see these little black boxes, these integrated circuits, as they're called, all over your circuit board, right? Um, and I think the real question is, why does this black box have such a different connotation than the AI black box? Do they mean the same thing, and can we maybe learn a little bit about how we understand these black boxes to explain the AI black box. Um, so way back when, when we were shipping these, uh, and this is this is uh, very specifically from 1971. So this is the 4004 Intel processor shipped again in 1971, very, very old computer. As you can see there over on the left, that is a very literal explanation of what is happening inside one of those tiny black boxes, right? And it's you know something about the size of, of this chip that we saw previously. Actually, a bit smaller. This is this is a little more modern. Um, and you see every single transistor laid out here, and you actually start to see exactly the same issue. It gets a little bit more complex because you also then have to realize, wait a second, you know, a transistor isn't just a transistor. If you break a transistor down even more fully, you end up with this semiconductor doping diagram that I don't think is particularly meaningful to anyone. And we realized this problem because as we increase the complexity of the problems that we were trying to solve in computers, the kinds of graphs that we used on the left, these very, very detailed, tell me what's happening in every neuron kind of explanations, very quickly cease to be meaningful, right? Um, a, a point that I think a lot of people don't realize is that um, the last chip that was ever designed entirely by a human being was in 1984. Um, so what that means is that every computer you've probably ever used has been designed by a computer. 
Um, and this question of, you know, what exactly is every transistor doing has grown to the point where it's, where it's almost uh, absurd. So how did they fix this problem? Well, they moved to data sheets. Um, what happened was the entire circuit industry said, okay, uh, this layer of abstraction where we're going through every single transistor is not helpful. You know, we don't understand it. Business users don't understand it, um, but we still need to understand what's happening here. Um, so they, they started, and this is actually, again, from that same 1971 processor to give you kind of this, this snapshot moment in history. They started explaining, how do you think about this in terms of a system? What does it do? How does it do it? And what do you really know, need to know in order to interact with this productively and gain trust and confidence that it's going to do what you think it's going to do? Okay. Um, very much the same paradox of explainability that, that we run into today. So the entire mentality here is let's get away from trying to go through every single little literal you know, circuit that's happening and instead focus on the high level, focus on what is important, what do we actually want to understand about this, and try to boil this up to a couple of questions that are going to be very critical, not just for this particular processor, but indeed for every processor from that point forward. And this is now sort of a very established uh, pattern. Um, so the first thing that I really want to do is, is draw a distinction between these two kinds of explanations, because I think everyone intuitively sees that this explanation is probably literally an explanation, um, and this is also an explanation, but they're very, very different. And the, the nomenclature we're kind of introducing to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate these two is the difference between a formal and a functional explanation. Um, and here we're laying it out at a at kind of a very high level and bringing this back to machine learning a little bit, right? These formal questions are very, very down in the weeds, right? Very much, you know, how many parameters does this model have? You know, how many, how many neurons are in your neural network, right? What network architecture are you using? You know, which paper are you implementing, right? This this network architecture gets us back to some of those earlier, earlier charts we were going through. You know, how many layers are you are you adjusting? And I think that there's there's that same sort of paradox, that same tension. These are all questions that a researcher probably cares quite a lot about. But when you talk about explainability, I don't think anyone would look at the answer to the one of these questions and say they now understand how the machine learning model works. So instead, let's focus a lot more on these functional questions, this functional concept of explainability. How accurate is this model? And how do you know? How did we test it, right? What mistakes does it make, right? Why does it make them? help me understand the decision-making process it's going through. And again, when I say decision-making process, I don't mean, you know, oh, neuron five and 10 and 24 were, you know, 0.5 too high, so it made the wrong explanation. What I want is, oh, it's, it's paying attention to the wrong thing here, right? Oh, it doesn't have enough data. Oh, we've got something bad in our training set, right? And very importantly, what assumptions does the model make? Right? What kind of data are we training this on? Right? Was this built on contracts and now we're trying to bring it over to Twitter? Right? So these aspects of, of functional explanation, I think, is really, really our assertion. This is what we need to be thinking about when we think about explainability. Um, so we kind of boil this down to something very, very simple. Right? How do you think about functional explainability? And for any deep learning model, uh, you can make it pretty straightforward. Does it do the right thing? for the right reason and learn from its mistakes. Now, obviously there's a lot underneath those three questions, right? There's a lot involved in correctly answering them, right? Does it do the right thing, right? Is it accurate? Exactly how accurate is it? And what do we mean when we say accuracy? Those are all difficult questions and things that we should grapple with. But at least these are the right questions to be asking. Um, and we're going to go through some answers to these as we go through the demo and kind of the rest of the presentation. But this is a lot of our, our point of view, is that the issue is not actually that, that these models are black boxes. In fact, the issue is almost the opposite, that we have too much transparency into how these models are working. What we don't have is the right level of clarity. Right? We can either go all the way down in the weeds and we can read research papers and you know, machine learning luckily is one of the most open fields that exists. Um, you know, pretty much every major paper is publicly released with source code. So we can get that if we want it, but that's not really the explanation that we're looking for. What we need is this middle ground, right? This middle ground that actually gets us functional explainability, right? That actually helps us understand how this is going to perform in the real world. So, um, the most important thing that I'm going to focus on um, for the rest of the presentation before I go to the demo is this question of, does it do the right thing? 
how do we know what the right thing is? How do we specify that in, in a machine learning context? And we're going to talk through a quick example to, to hopefully help this, help this resonate. Let's talk about spam detection. So this is, this is relatively typical, right? Let's just say we have a, a fictitious, we're building a spam detection algorithm, uh, uh, specifically an AI-based solution. And let's say we have 10% spam coming in and we have 90% ham, right? Ham is just sort of the, the machine learning term for not spam. Um, there's a couple different ways we can approach this problem. Um, but first, let, let's figure out what do we mean when we say accuracy? Um, there's a few different ways of thinking about accuracy. Um, the full treatment of what we mean when we say accuracy is, is out of the course of this, this webinar. That's, that's a graduate class, but um, at the very least, we can go through some basics, right? There's literal accuracy, right? Uh, and that actually has quite a few, few different meanings. But if we talk about the data science accuracy, um, this is kind of the question of how many things did we get right? You know, how many pieces of spam did we correctly predict? How many pieces of ham did we correctly predict over all of the messages that we've got? Right. Um, we've got precision as sort of the second metric. Um, precision saying, when we said it was ham, were we right? Right. So it's all of the things where we predicted ham, right? Where we were, uh, you know, how many of them were we actually correct on? Right. And the flip side of this is, is recall. Um, and I'll, I'll spend a little bit on the, on the left side in a bit, just because these are, these are slightly tricky uh, concepts to, to grapple with. Um, recall is a question of, of all of the ham out there that I was supposed to get, how much did I actually tag, right? So the precision and recall really are the two, two uh, sort of pivot points here, right? Precision saying, when I made a prediction, was it right? Uh, recall saying, of all the times where I should have made the prediction, how many times did I actually make the prediction? Um, over here on the left, you'll see a visual that's a helpful way to think about this. Um, over here on the left, we can think this is all of the ham out there, right? Over on the right, this is all of the spam. Um, these false positives are, oh, we predicted it as ham, right? Uh, it was actually spam. True negatives are, it was spam, we said it was spam. Uh, true positives, it was ham, we said it was ham. False negatives, um, it was ham, we said it was spam. Um, if you couldn't quite follow that, again, that's okay. There, there's a lot here, and, and uh, the, the practical examples will make a, a bit more sense. So let's take our first algorithm, our first AI approach to spam detection. Uh, there is no spam, right? So I'm, I'm going to say that, uh, nothing is spam. My algorithm simply looks at every message and says, it is definitely not spam. You should do this. Does this work? Uh, how well does it work? How accurate is it? Well, the thing is, the accuracy is actually really good. Um, from an accuracy perspective, this is 90% accurate. But if you start looking at some of these other metrics, right, um, the picture becomes a little bit less clear. You know, the precision, also really, really good. You know, of all the things that were supposed to be marked ham, you know, uh, you know, I got 90% of them. Or, or rather, of all the things I said was ham, you know, I was right 90% of the time. And of all the ham I was supposed to get, I got all of it. My recall is 100%, my precision is 90%, my accuracy is 90%. Uh, good model, right? Should we ship it? Maybe not. Um, when you start to look a little bit more deeply, and this is why these other metrics are so important, right? The big issue there is there's no such thing as a spam precision metric here, right? I've never predicted spam, so it's impossible to say how well I'm actually detecting spam. And really importantly, that recall metric for spam is, is a total 0%. Of all the spam we were supposed to get, we got none of it. Okay, so, so maybe we didn't quite get it right on the first try, but let's, let's take another approach, one where we'll actually predict spam. Let's just say that only emails that have the word Viagra more than once are spam. Uh, you know, we can be very confident that if an email says Viagra more than once, it's spam. You know, let's 100% confident that if that happens, it's spam. And let's say this is 1% of your full email volume, so this is, you know, about 10% of, of all the spam is, is this particular flavor of spam. So th this is actually better. This is actually quite a bit better, right? right? So the accuracy jumps up a little bit, right? We get that extra one precision correspondingly a little bit better uh, just because we're not categorizing everything as ham. Um, and the precision for our spam prediction is, is 100%, right? Because anything that looks like that is, is definitely spam. So we got that. Now, the recall for the spam is still quite poor, right? We're only getting 10% of all the spam. One of the things that we have to ask now, though, is, is that a problem, right? How much of a problem is that? 
are we okay with this model or not? Uh, and the truth is it varies really drastically on your use case. In some situations, this might be fine, right? Some cases it might not be. But what you need to really make that decision is A, to understand your use case, and B, to really understand these metrics in, in a detailed way, right? We need to understand, you know, is 10% recall for spam acceptable or not? What are we really optimizing for in the business scenario? So let me let me just kind of go through one other uh, one that might you know at first look like a relatively reasonable trade off, uh, and again kind of how these how these accuracy metrics change. Let's just decide randomly ten percent is spam. We know ten percent of it is spam overall, so let's just say every you know tenth message or so we decide is spam. The metrics actually still look pretty good, don't they? Right. 82% accurate, 9% precision, 90% recall. You know, if you looked at these metrics in isolation, you might actually think this was working pretty well. Um, again, you know, once you dig in a little bit below the surface, it becomes clear that it's not actually performing relatively well compared to the others. This happens to be, you know, uh, even even worse than some of the others. But but in an absolute sense, um, it still performs relatively well. So. The question that we have to ask ourselves now is, okay, we, we've got all these metrics and we've got a couple of sort of silly algorithms, but we don't really understand what we're trying to do yet. Um, and if we're trying to explain to someone, well, does the model work or not? You start to immediately realize that this concept of accuracy is really insufficient, right? If I come back and someone says, well, does the spam detection algorithm work? And I say it's 90% accurate. Your immediate assumption is, oh yeah, then it works. It's, it's great. It's like, oh, well, it, it just assumes nothing is spam. And, and so you start to realize why, why this concept is uh, not, not really sufficient. So let's talk about a couple of different ways that we could think about this. Um, so one framing says, OK, uh, when I make my spam detection algorithm, I want to make sure that I'm not missing any good emails. I want to make sure that none of the emails coming in get accidentally flagged as spam. Uh, so then what I really care about there then is the precision for spam and the recall for ham, right? I want to make sure the recall for ham is as close to 100% as possible, and I want to make sure that the precision for spam is very, very high. Um, so actually, the, uh, the kind of Viagra algorithm here is pretty perfect. You know, we're sure that we're never going to miss any ham, um, you know, reasonably sure. On the flip side, oh, sorry, um, I don't want to see any spam. This is kind of full title. Let's say you're getting absolutely inundated from spam. It's okay if we miss some of the accurate messages and filter them over to spam, so long as none of our spam gets into our main inbox folder. Here we care about the total opposite, right? Here we really care about the precision for ham, and we care quite a lot about the recall rate for spam. How much of that spam are we capturing? Now, and, and I want to pause here for a second. Because if I said these two goals initially, right, I don't want to see any spam, right, and I don't want to miss any ham, they don't seem like they're in conflict. They said, you know, they, these are the two things that we want from every single spam detection algorithm out there, right? And yet, they were entirely flipped in terms of what you're optimizing for if you actually build a system to solve these. So what then also becomes pretty apparent is that we need to think about this differently. Um, this is actually probably not the right way of doing it, this binary ham versus spam. So, so how do we think about it? Um, a lot of people will immediately jump to say, oh, oh, I know. We'll use the confidence level, right? We'll say, OK, it'll only be spam if it's at least 90% confident. Problem solved. But what does confidence mean? Um, if people have worked with machine learning vendors in the past, you'll know every single vendor tax confidence onto their predictions, right? Now, people usually never stop to ask, okay, what does 90% confident mean? Does it mean that, you know, the precision is 90% at that level? Does it mean the recall is 90% at that level? For what class, you know, for what does that 90% mean? And, and the dirty little secret is that, um, there's actually no meaning in a confidence level by itself. Um, what you need to actually interpret this and understand what's happening in the model is what's called a precision recall curve. Um, so hopefully this, this makes a little bit more sense than it would have at the very start here. But let's shift our frame and say, OK, I want to miss no more than 1% of all the incoming messages. Right? You can't say, I don't want it all the way to the left, all the way to the right, because that ends you up in, in kind of absurd territory very, very quickly. So instead, embrace the error, say errors are going to happen. 
what we want to say is what's an acceptable error rate for us, right? Or if 1% of the incoming messages can be sent out to him, then the question is, okay, what then will the other error rates be? Uh, and what this precision recall curve will let you do is, well, let's say that we were okay with that 20% error rate, you know, sort of 20% precision, 20% of the incoming mail. What you do is you go across to the right and say, okay, well, at that particular level, um, you know, what, you know, how much of all of it are we going to get? And here you can see, you know, it comes out about, about 23. So what that says is that if you want to make sure that you're not sending any more than 20% of your incoming mail into spam incorrectly, you're only going to be getting 30% of the spam. Now, that's a pretty bad algorithm uh, for this particular case, but that's how you need to be framing these, these trade-offs. Um, now, what I really want to do is, is switch over to seeing this live, right? Um, Spam detection is, is a pretty solved problem, right? We don't really have error rates anywhere near this right now. Uh, so let's let's talk about something that's a little bit more interesting. Uh, and for this, I'm going to flip over to uh, to our tool. Uh, so it, you'll see here the module that we call Review by Indico. And this is all oriented around explainability. The question is, again, how well is the model working? Uh, how is it making its decisions, right? And how can we correct its errors? So the first thing that you always want to do, and, and what we've done here, sort of this model, is we've loaded in 10,000 tweets for different products and different airlines and then sort of things along those lines. You know, there, there's a lot of airline comments in here. Uh, and we have tagged them with positive, negative, and neutral to figure out what sentiment they've got. And we've got a model that, you know, we can look at the precision recall numbers here. Okay, not great. Right, you know, uh, and we want to understand uh, what kind of errors it makes and whether or not they're acceptable. The first thing that we want to do is, is a quick intuitive test, right? You know, let's say uh, great product, at You know, let's just see that it's doing something reasonable. Um, so the first thing that we're going to want to look at is what prediction did it make? Okay, so it predicted it as positive. Maybe that's right, maybe that's not. It's got, it's got a mix here, right? Uh, and then negative a second. That, that's an okay prediction in the grand scheme of things. But the next thing we want to understand is, okay, why did you make that prediction? Uh, so what we can do here is we can actually click into positive and, and ask it to explain us. Okay, pretty reasonable, great product, that's pretty positive. Uh, flip over to negative, that's like pretty negative. You know, it drifts a little bit. Uh, looks like people probably mention products in negative scenarios most often, but it's paying attention to approximately the right things. Um, the other question we want to ask is, did we give it training data that's sort of appropriate here? So we scroll down here, these are all uh, examples that the model is using to kind of base that decision, right? So again, when we ask that explainability question, why is it making this prediction? This is, this is how we dig into it. So we see here, up here, the positive things, great experience on the flight, right? Kind of saying, hey, this product is really good, right? Great flight, great flight, and down, you know, a bad flight. So not super surprising, what the model is saying is, yeah, I've got some stuff that's, you know, good, you know, more product-centric, focusing on the food, uh, and I've got some stuff about bad flights, and I'm sort of predicting on both of those, which is exactly what it should be doing. You know, it doesn't have anything that looks exactly like that, uh, but, but all pretty close. So that's, that's one way of looking at this, but there's a few different ways of digging in. Um, what we're going to do next is jump into a few examples that we're getting wrong over here, and we want to understand why we're getting this wrong. Um, so let's jump over here, right, just, just kind of the first example. You know, does anyone know the whole times for U.S. Airways reservations? So this was tagged as neutral. We predicted it as negative. And this is one of the things that immediately sort of shows up when you start examining machine learning models. You know, I look at this, and... Maybe it's not explicitly negative. My guess is that if someone's asking for hold times, it's probably negative. Um, you know, that, that's probably someone sitting on hold that's not super, super happy. But let's see. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll paste it and we want to see, okay, exactly what here is negative, what here is neutral, what data did we give it that's pushing it one way or the other? Uh, so we see, hey, it thinks this is negative. Why does it think this is negative? Talking about hold times and specifically U.S. Airways reservations. Uh, and you know, if we look at what's neutral, it's the rest of it. You know, hey, does anyone know? Yeah, that's that's not a very strong signal. And then we jump down here and we say, okay, why is it making this decision? Oh, U.S. Airways. Hey, is anyone there? I'm still on hold. 
uh, now what, you canceled my flight, uh, how do I get a hold of someone that has my reservation, right? So this is, this is a, a canceled reservation on the second one, to, to be clear. So what we see here is there, there's clearly a, a bad pattern of people on hold at U.S. Airways for a long time. We've told that that's probably negatively correlated. The models picked up on it and kind of fed that back. Go through this, this process with, with one other example, and then let me uh, flip over to a precision recall. Um, let's see. This is a good one. This one, this one has, a, has a good mixture, right? So JetBlue, the TV Wi-Fi was spotty. It's just a nice feature for a cross-country flight. Still won't keep us away. We love JetBlue. Um, again, sort of a reasonable confusion, labeled as negative, predicted as positive. It's just got features of both, right? Um, so let's see exactly what it's picking up on, whether we're comfortable with that error or not. Jump in, again, sort of paste it in because we want to understand how this is going to work in production. Um, okay, so we can see here the model is just as confused as we are, right? It's leaning towards positive, but negative is, is just almost as high. And you kind of look down here and you see, oh, okay, this is someone who's a little bit upset at Southwest, but is then kind of okay with it. It's got that similar pattern where it says, hey, you did something sort of negative, um, but you know, uh, I still like Southwest, so I'm not really going to complain. We tag it as positive. Down here, we say, oh, someone's television not working, but the Wi-Fi was good, so that makes up for it. Here, we tag it as negative. Yeah, you know. Seems kind of reasonable, um, and yeah, this is just someone generically talking about JetBlue. So not, not a huge amount of data it's basing off of, but let's do that same sort of dig in. What are the positive aspects here? You know, okay, yeah, Wi-Fi by itself would be positive, but it kind of fades down here. Oh, the fact that it was spotty, no longer positive. Would be a nice feature, but then you start looking, oh, the fact that they're mentioning that they were on a uh, cross-country flight probably tends us towards negative. And then you say, oh, still won't keep us away still won't keep us away, um, that won't is really clearly highlighted, right? That negation is what flips sort of that whole thing from, from kind of negative to positive. Uh, and then, you know, we can see, see the reverse here, right? The Wi-Fi was spotty. That's what was negative. Um, them saying, oh, you know, it would just be nice for a cross-country flight is like a really clear kind of passive-aggressive signal. And that saying, you know, still, you know, keep us away, that will all be negative by itself, but kind of that won't flipping us over. So again, just kind of a high level, let's understand what is the model telling us, what data have we given it to base off of. If we decide that we disagree with any of these labels, we might want to wipe them out, relabel them. That's very, very common. Uh, the other thing that I just want to uh, focus on kind of as we, as we start wrapping this up is, is the same precision recall curve, right? So you saw the example before. This is a live one. Uh, let's say in our particular use case, what we really care about is that we want to be grabbing the negative tweets, right? Let's say we're, we're an airline, we really want to understand the complaints that customers have, uh, and we don't want to incorrectly tag any of them. Um, so, you know, here we've got this negative line. Let's say that we are okay with uh, about a 15% error rate, right? It's okay if 15% of the things we tag as negative aren't really negative. So we drag this all the way over to the right to, you know, about that 0.85 crossover point. And then we can say, oh, okay, you know, that corresponds with a, with a kind of confidence value of about 0.8, right? So we've got that number. We know exactly what error rate it means now. Um, you know, we can sort of mouse over here. We can see exactly what the precision and recall values are at that number. And again, sort of what, what the cutoff is. Um, and, you know, we scroll down here, and what we're really seeing now is what errors do we make where we've got pretty high confidence in our mistake, right? Because this is another really important thing. Confidence is not sort of this, this panacea. Um, so we see something like this, right? I'm not blaming JetBlue. This wasn't weather. Can't have planes in the air and runaways a mess. That's a disaster waiting to happen. I'm not really sure what they're talking about here. Um, again, if I read this myself, I would probably tag it as negative. Uh, it was tagged as neutral. That also sort of seems okay. I think that's that's an error that, that we're fine with, right? Um, and you know, we can we can look through these and see again. A lot of these are kind of ambiguous. Um, you know, I'm 30 minutes out. Wait for me. A lot of crying faces. Um, neutral, negative. Again, kind of hard to say. Very much feels like an error. I'd be pretty pretty okay with. Um, you know, if we if we bring this back a little bit and say, okay, you know, the ones at, at this level, 
Oh, yeah. yeah. I, this, this is just Miss Tag data here, right? I can't bring up, up my reservations online using the flight bookings as problem. Um, that's definitely a negative experience. Yeah, that's just not neutral Miss Tag data. It happens all the time, but usually it's really, really hard to find. Um, yeah, and this is another one. You need to contact me ASAP. I'm furious. Uh, I don't know how that got tagged as neutral, but you know, you tag us 10,000 tweets and you make mistakes. Um, but at least here you can find it. You can understand, okay, we tagged as negative. Again, I'm, I'm fine with that uh, you know, sort of error. Uh, and you know, what data is it using to, to base that on? Seems sort of reasonable. Um, so that's kind of a high level. This is. Uh, there are a few different ways of digging into it. You know, we could jump into precision recall here, specifically see, you know, true positives, false positives, you know, all the sort of different error rates. Um, uh, the confusion matrix over here, this gives us a sense, you know, how frequently are we specifically saying that something negative was actually positive? So I can, um, I can click in there. Um, and so you see that's negative. So the true was negative, the predicted was positive. Um, Yeah, so, you know, something that we might want to dig into a little bit, confidence is not too high, so we can decide whether or not we're concerned about that. But really, really the point is that this is a very different way of approaching explainability than I think a lot of people focus on, this question of what kind of errors is it making. We really need to focus on why it's making these mistakes, figure out whether or not we can correct them and whether or not I'm comfortable with them. Uh, explainability that's very functionally focused, very trust-based, right? And all, all surrounding that question of how do I get comfortable enough with an algorithm to ship it into production? So uh, without further ado, we'll flip this over to questions. Okay, okay, thank you very much indeed, indeed Fletcher. Fletcher. And so those of you that are watching at home, you can, of course, put your questions into the Q&A box, uh, click send, and we will receive them here. But first of all, I just wanted to ask you, Fletcher, what, so what, what are the various problems that you that clients have brought to you that you've been asked to solve? Yeah, so we, we deal with a lot of document-based processes across the enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. is something that we've run into occasionally, but it's not uh, an extremely mainline use case. It's a lot more common for us is think like contract analytics, right? Where we'd be extracting a particular clause, right? Making a determination as to sort of the legal impact of a given clause. Um, uh, some that are very common are what we call semi-structured use cases. So the idea is you have a trade confirmation that comes across, you want to extract the relevant fields in that trade confirmation, pass it on down the road. And again, if you make a mistake, pointing someone at a neuron is not something that's going to be acceptable to a compliance officer. Instead, what you need to say is, oh yeah, we made this mistake because this is the data that we've had previously, sort of down here, you get this audit trail exactly why that mistake is made uh, and exactly sort of what the rate of that kind of error is going to be. So a lot of a lot of cases where sort of very very sensitive documents that we're dealing with um, and things along those lines, but you know, contract analytics, uh, trade confirmation, uh, things along those lines. Okay, I was, I was actually chatting to the um, to the CMO of Finastra, who was saying that they. It's, it's interesting you bring up the the whole thing about about the law because he was saying that they have something like three thousand rule and regulation changes every month across the, across the planet, and so. Uh, so, do you think AI is something that we're, we're going to we're going to um, we're not going to be able to do without? I think that specifically in the regulatory environment, it's getting increasingly difficult to do without. Uh, we work with companies all the time that have very complex manual processes that have very little transparency. Actually, when, when we talk about sort of the black box problem that we mentioned a bit earlier. Um, what happens is that you have a huge amount of individual knowledge, right? We talk about what happened when, let's say, let's say Brexit pops up, right? You know, it's a, it's a bit nobody saw coming, right? Something that requires you to reevaluate probably your entire uh, contract base and your entire set of agreements if you're a UK-based company. Um, now, we haven't run into very many of those situations just as a society, right? Where these companies that have been around for, for many decades and have these very large legal repositories have to do these kinds of analyses. Um, but what we found is that today, when a company has to do one of these audits, it's a many month long process. They often have to have you know dozens of people working on this sort of full time around the clock. And you talk to those individuals, uh, 
they find that a very small percentage of the work they do is value add. A much larger percentage of it is sitting through document structures, going through 200 pages to find the one clause that they want, and then that final determination of do we have to change anything or renegotiate this contract, which is what you really want people doing. Uh, they don't they don't get to that till the last sort of 10 percent of the job that they're tasked with doing. Um, so we run into it really frequently, and I think the the clip of these large changes is becoming greater. Sort of the repositories of documents are becoming larger. Um, we find all the time in our customers they're they're terrified that several more of these events are going to show up and basically force them to stop new contract negotiations. Uh, you know, LIBOR obviously is, is a very big piece that recently happened and changing the rules around reserves that have to be held. Uh, you know, it's something that really nobody expected to happen. People have been signing these contracts for, for decades without a lot of attention paid to exactly what's in them. And now they find themselves having to potentially renegotiate all of them. So I think it's going to be progressively more and more difficult as we kind of look to the future. Um, but uh, it's not quite impossible to do without it yet. I think that that crossing over point is going to be somewhere in the next five years. Okay, lovely. Let's go to a couple of audience questions. We've got uh, Carlos Abiz here, who said, is it full potential for business when combined with other approaches? Um, what do you say? Because I should imagine AI is one of those things you can combine with all kinds of other things. We talk about RPA quite a lot over here. So, um, would you like to address that? Yeah, so I, I think that that's a really good way to think about it, right? I think that too often people sort of assume, you know, AI is solving the, the whole problem sort of end to end, you know, we'll point it at some documents and it'll, it'll just go, right? And we use the sentiment analysis example. It's a good uh, good sort of piece that it runs into account with that, right? The AI is really responsible for telling, hey, is the tweet positive or negative, right? And when you look at kind of the whole problem, what you want to do is you want to sift through everything coming out of the Twitter data stream, right? What you want to do is then some analytics and some data visualization, something like that. Right. You might even potentially want to automate the creation and sending a report in an RPA system. We see these kind of integrations all the time, uh, and I think that that's absolutely the right way to think about it. I mean, the AI is a very, very powerful tool, um, and one that definitely has strong synergies with kind of the, the current evolving uh, ecosystem. So, yeah, I, I do think to get the full potential, you know, RPA is a very right place for integration, uh, and it's really data visualization tools right now. Another really good integration point. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, another question here from Vernon Budinger um, from Neural Profit Engines, who says, What about using explainable statistical analysis to back into results that you do not understand, like using regression to understand PCA? Yeah, so that's actually a lot closer to, to the approach that we're, we're really trying to advocate for here. Um, and I think that there's uh, sort of an important delta, um, and I'll I'll try to do this at, at, at an appropriate level of granularity, right? But let's say that you're running a, a PCA analysis. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis. So the idea is you give it a bunch of documents and you ask it to find sort of the principal components. Um, now, what exactly principal component means? Um, technically, it's a very straightforward definition. Um, to a business user, there's really no way to decipher it. Um, uh, the way to think about it is it's a direction along which things are distributed, sort of the, the main uh, constituents. Now, one of the, one of the primary problems um, with that is that exactly what your sort of PCA decides is relevant about the data set is not going to be immediately obvious. Or another place where you see this issue show up all the time is with kind of automatic clustering. Right. If I get a bunch of documents in, I ask the machine learning uh, model exactly sort of how they should be grouped, right, and what sort of the most important kind of themes here are. And often the themes don't really align with your intuition, right? And, and the question is, okay, there, there's two possibilities there. Because the machine learning algorithm in that case, you know, it's not, it's not quite accurate to call it wrong. It's doing exactly what you told it to do. It's just not what you expect it to do. Um, and what you do really need to do in that situation is, is sort of twofold. I think one is it's really important to not assume that the solution is sort of the obvious technical one, right? So generally, we strongly advise against using any kind of automatic clustering, right, or kind of any automatic theme detection, just because the ability to uh, sort of reconcile it with what the human would want at the other side is uh, very, very lacking and kind of tough. 
Um, so this, this question of using explainable statistical analysis to kind of back out, uh, that is basically the idea that when we apply one of these and we've done it sort of in the, in the older sort of push forward rather than go from the endpoint and intuit it backwards, um, when sort of going forward with traditional statistical tools yields something that's unintuitive, what do we do in that situation? Um, and, you know, additional statistical analysis can definitely be helpful. Um, what we find more frequently, though, is that the, the best solution is to start from an endpoint that the user understands very well. Um, so, you know, generally staying away from approaches like PCA or automatic clustering. Um, and instead starting with sort of a target that the user understands very, very well. Because having to explain to them, here's what this statistical technique is doing, and here's why it's not doing what you expect. Is, is very, very difficult to do. Um, it's much easier for you to say, here's where I want it to end up, and then we can say, oh, okay, here's why we're not there yet. Um, so that's kind of how we talk about shifting shifting that narrative and shifting that dialogue. Um, you know, we've often tried, sort of, especially in our earlier days, to take some of these uh, statistical approaches and make them more to business users, but we find that uh, unless we've got some anchor in that discussion, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to predictively to uh, predictively work to a an explainable explainable understanding. Sure, I'm just, I'm just interested in how. How, how people, people approach, approach you, what, what sort of stage, stage they're at on their journey as they, they come, come to you. Is it, do they, they find this is, 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 is an, at the next logical step, step, or do they, they find that they're, that they're coming to you just to a, a real problem and they're, they're, they're kind of behind the curve? I think it's, it's a little bit all over the place. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the minuses of AI is that there's a lot of hype out there. Uh, and there are definitely customers that are very, very early in their journey that probably haven't necessarily tried to implement anything. Uh, and have only heard kind of the promises of AI, and they'll often show up with sort of unrealistic expectations. We typically have to talk them through what is actually possible here, how do you formulate your problems. I think really critically, uh, that, that concept of starting with your output, starting with your goal, and working backwards is kind of the biggest piece that they, they have difficulty wrapping their heads around. Uh, so, you know, a classic thing that a, a very new customer uh, will come to us and say something along the lines of, Oh, uh, you know, we want to understand whether or not people like our company. Uh, so can you just go sort of, you know, scrape the internet? They always say that, scrape the internet, uh, and, and tell us whether or not people like our company. Um, and when you have that sort of really broad formulation, you sort of say, hmm, that's that's tricky, right? I don't really know what you mean when you say either scrape the internet or like my company. So we really have to sort of walk them through. Okay, no, let's like, talk about. In particular, what do you want to monitor? You want to monitor Twitter? Great. Now let's talk about what you mean when you say like my company, right? Um, you know, sentiment might get you somewhere, but it's probably not going to be exactly what you want. Um, uh, so that's sort of a really common arc. Uh, we see a lot of people also uh, who don't necessarily have any AI experience, uh, but have processes and business line experience. These we usually find are actually some of the best customers. They show up and say, hey, we have a problem. We're looking for a solution. We were told that it couldn't really be solved, but maybe AI gives us a way to do it. Because once you've got that problem well solved, the output's really well understood, and again, working backwards from that is very doable. Uh, and, and sort of the third, the third camp is people that have already implemented these solutions, have already attempted to ship them into production, and have already kind of stubbed their toe running right the lot of these issues. Uh, these are also kind of uh, pretty good because I think the thing is that. When you had someone show up and ask why did it make a mistake in production, you understand exactly why you need a tool for explainability and exactly why the response of, oh, you know, this is a particular coefficient that led to this response it is not really a satisfying or adequate response. Um, so that's kind of the, the spectrum. I would say that right now um, there's a pretty wide distribution. I think people overall are pretty new in their, their AI understanding. I think that we generally find that organizations that haven't made an explicit point to uh, invest really, really heavily in the space, you know, and it's not people who are deciding today to invest in that because it doesn't work if you just start today. Um, but we're talking about people that built up data science teams, you know, 10 years ago, right? Um, they're usually really, really far ahead of the curve. I think a lot of people do jump in and they're a bit earlier and they've heard all the promise of AI and they kind of have this idea that they can go out, you know, hire a couple of data scientists and be off to the races. And it's, it's not that easy. It's not that straightforward. Uh, the talent is, is very much locked up in sort of larger organizations. Um, and, you know, the, 
the cost and time required to build a lot of these solutions is such that, you know, you're going to run into this explainability problem probably 18 months, two years after you started down this road and find yourself kind of really without a solution. So uh, we see a lot of people in the game as well. Okay, sure. okay. sure. That's, that's, that's interesting. interesting. I mean, I mean there's, there's, um, um, we, we just published a little bit of research, research which suggested that, that most, most people see themselves as being well ahead of the curve and, and, and innovators, and they see their, their industry as being slightly behind them, and then whatever, whatever, whatever company they work for as being slightly behind, behind that. that. I don't, I don't know, know that's, that's, if that's true or if that's, that's just human nature expressing, expressing itself in a survey, but it's quite interesting how um, how people perceive themselves and their, and their, and the companies that they, they're part of. Um, I, I think we're going to leave it there. So a huge thanks to you, Slater Victorov. Thanks very much indeed for your time. Um, and don't forget, if you're listening, you can contact Slater. The details are on his biography page, which are right there. You can also reach out to me by email. I'm ian at hexnetwork.com. And I'm Ian R. Hawkins on LinkedIn, and I always welcome the opportunity to connect. So if you found this useful, please do keep an eye out for more webinars that we're running, including a series on process mining from the 25th to the 27th of March. And wherever you are in the world, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for listening.